This is Bob Jenkins from Lipper. Thank you for joining us once again for another installment of our Meet the Manager interview series. Today I'm joined by Brian Moreland and Nancy Angel from GWNK Investments. They're the co-managers of the Municipal Enhanced Yield Fund. Brian and Nancy, thank you for joining us today. First of all, I'd like to ask you about the strategy of your fund. Tell me if you would a little bit about the process and what sets you apart from your peers. Sure. Well, thanks, Bob, for having us here today. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the Enhanced Yield Fund. And our fund targets uh, longer maturity, lower rated, higher yielding securities. And we're really looking to capitalize on the really strong characteristics uh, as far as yield and return go of the long end of the market while capturing the credit spreads on triple B and single A rated credits. And what sets us apart is our duration in that we are longer, I think, than most of our peers in the high yield space, yet much more defensive on the credit side. Okay. So even though we have about a 60% um, you know, allocation to triple B rated credits, that puts us in the high yield category uh, for Lipper. But uh, on the other hand, 95% of the credits are actually what I would consider investment grade, which means triple B or higher. Um, versus funds where you see more like um, about 40% below investment grade. So high quality longer duration. Exactly. Okay. So that I think is, an, and really overall the approach is active and research intensive. And one other thing that really sets us apart from the, the peer group is our exposure to non-rated bonds where we do not have a single non-rated bond in the portfolio where the peer group has 25% invested in non-rated bonds, which we view are highly speculative. They're an uh, uh, unproven revenue source, uh, startup in nature, you have construction risk, and uh, we just feel like the risk reward profile does, is just not appropriate for the fund there. Okay. Now tell me, your approach to investing in the fund, is it more of a top-down or bottom-up? And, and what advantage does that afford your investors? Uh, I would say for, for this fund, we are more of a bottom-up uh, approach. Uh, it, it all starts with credit research. I mean, that's, it's 100% done in-house. Uh, we have a, a strong team of analysts. They assign an internal rating, an outlook, and a recommendation for every bond in the portfolio. They present those to the credit committee. So the, the, we have a very rigorous process for any bond that, to make its way into the portfolio. Um, at that point, once it is added, we will look to add to the positions over time mm -hmm. um, and, and by buying cheaper odd lots and adding to positions whenever possible. Um, I would say the bottom-up approach, though, it, we, we really focus on that more so than the top-down approach. Okay. Uh, the top-down is instituted more so in our separate accounts and in our intermediate fund, where we're a little more reactive to interest rates, okay. whereas this fund in particular is always going to maintain a long bias in terms of and, and trying to maximize yield. So we really just focus more so on a bottom-up approach. Okay, with that backdrop, tell me, do you think this fund is more suited to an aggressive or conservative investor? That is not a simple question, um, and because it really depends how you define risk. Are you talking about interest rate risk, credit risk, a reinvestment risk? If you're talking simply about volatility, uh, yes, this is going to be better suited for an aggressive investor because it has an option adjusted duration of about 11, which is twice that of a higher quality intermediate fund. Uh, if you're talking about credit risk, um, this is certainly going to be somewhat more risky than a high quality portfolio, but again, a lot more defensive versus our peers in the high yield universe. Right. So when you look at the risk in this portfolio, you're really talking about, on the credit side, systemic risk, and that's the risk of credit spread widening across the entire market. Right. Um, from you know, an individual issuer perspective, uh, the, I would say the default rate is very low, just given the general nature of the triple B sector as well as the credit work uh, that we do on, the, um, on each individual credit. Yep. So, um, you know, and, and also, you know, just looking um, overall at the number of issues that we have in the portfolio at, at 65, it's very well diversified, which helps to further mitigate any idiosyncratic risk. The last risk I want to address is reinvestment risk, and, and that's the risk uh, that, you, that interest rates actually decline further from here, and we are forced to invest in a lower rate environment. And it's a risk that is often overlooked in this market. And to protect against that risk, you really have to have exposure to longer term bonds. And not just bonds with longer maturities, but ones with good call protection. And to that end, I feel that this fund offers a very good solution for clients that are looking to protect their income for the long term. 
So it's not a simple answer, um, <laughs> but uh, to sum it up, I think you know f uh, that because of the increased volatility, uh, overall it's not a fund that you put 100% of your fixed income exposure in, mm -hmm. but it is a great complement to shorter term, higher quality strategies. Okay. And that's how we see it best utilized. So your fund actually has more of a national focus to it in terms of your universe that you select from. What advantages does that have over a state focused strategy? Well, most state funds are required to maintain approximately 80% of their assets in paper that is exempt from the home state. Whereas with the national approach, we have the uh, flexibility to move across the map. And I think whereas markets move and profiles change in a particular state, the economy can change, there could be issuance patterns, spreads can widen, but unfortunately for those state funds, they're pretty much locked into investing in their home state. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a national approach, we feel like we can uncover a lot of opportunities that on an after-tax basis make sense for an individual investor. Um, we feel like we can diversify properly across geography, across issuers, across sectors, and even you know, I including different call structures. So we feel like it's, a, it's advantageous, especially in the high yield space, yeah. to consider a national approach. If you would, please share your thoughts on your prospects for the municipal market more generally, given the performance of the last few years. Sure. Uh, it is true that we're coming off historically low rates, and it is, uh, you know, a great fear out there of interest rates increasing from mm -hmm. here. Uh, however, you know, the Fed appears to be on hold, um, anchoring short-term rates, and with our yield curve as steep it, as it is, uh, and inflation being kept um, relatively tame, it it's hard to imagine long-term rates rising significantly from here. Uh, the good news is that if the economic momentum does pick up, then we should see credit fundamentals improve in our market and credit spreads compress further, which will help to offset the longer duration um, of, our, of our fund. Um, and in addition to that, just I think you know, the good news for us as active managers is that we do have a steep yield curve and historically wide credit spreads, which gives us an opportunity to add value right. uh, in the portfolio. And um, you know, also we're looking at municipals uh, on a relative basis trading relatively cheap mm -hmm. when you look at it versus their taxable counterparts of right. treasuries. So we're looking at municipal treasury ratios of 100% across the entire curve. So wow. that does provide some cushion hmm. to any backup in rates in the broader market. Um, and also, you know, in general, credit fundamentals continue to improve despite the ugly headlines you read about. Um, these are really isolated cases and we continue, um, we believe that will continue. And uh, you know, just lastly, I think the longer term demographics are very strong for municipals because we have higher tax rates which certainly make them more attractive mm -hmm. on an after tax basis and also an aging population where there continues to be a strong demand for fixed income. Speaking of the tax exempt status, do you see any political threats to that status going forward? Well, there's certainly been a lot of talk and concern about uh, change in tax legislation that may affect the exemption of municipal bonds. Uh, first, an outright elimination of the exemption, as initially proposed in the Simpson-Bowles plan, is highly unlikely. Um, the most likely scenario, if there is one, is, a, is one that was proposed by President Obama. This would effectively impose an 11.6% tax on those in the highest tax brackets uh, with an adjusted gross income over 250000 Yet, even today, uh, that proposal seems less likely than a few months ago. Uh, there's been a lot of lobbying going on in Washington, and just a couple weeks ago, the House Ways and Means Committee held a hearing to talk about how uh, the change in federal uh, tax reform would affect state and local governments. Mm -hmm. And I think the message was pretty loud and clear uh, from, you know, the, delivered by the stakeholders there about how this would, in effect, raise the uh, cost for municipalities, which would effectively be passed on to the individual taxpayers. Right. So, uh, you know, I think uh, we have to clearly wait and see now if there will be any type of um, curtailment of this exemption. Uh, but it, it looks to be a little bit more positive. And, um, you know, just going forward, if there is any type of cutback on the exemption, it will, the burden will be, will, will be borne by the municipalities in the form of higher borrowing costs. And in the end, investors will be fine because they will just require a higher yield to compensate them for this higher tax. Right, right. 
Looking back over the history of the fund, what are the primary drivers of success? Well, the fund has outperformed its peer group over the last five years and ranked in the third percentile. Uh, the big performance driver has come from the duration of the fund. Right. It, is a, it is a long fund, as Nancy alluded to earlier, with a duration of 11. So with rates coming down as they have over the past few years, longer funds that had an allocation to spread product mm -hmm. outperformed. Right. Um, and looking forward, we feel like while triple B spreads have compressed uh, from the credit crisis of 2008, we do feel like there are still opportunities out there in the space and, and across certain sectors. Mm -hmm. And we feel like with the economy recovering and default rates remaining low, we do feel like this is a, a good opportunity for investors. Um, we also have benefited from our call protection, which we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. that we focus on 20 to 30 year bonds with eight to 10 years worth of call protection. So in a market with declining rates, those bonds are gonna outperform bonds for, that have, have shorter calls, uh, which some of our peer group would be invested in. But um, going forward, we, we like the prospects for the fund. We feel like it's benefited from our active trading that we've done. We buy a lot of odd lots. We also, all of our portfolio is available for sale on a mm -hmm. daily basis. So we fill uh, various one-off state uh, retail inquiries. And we definitely look to turn over the portfolio. If, if we see names that have tightened significantly, we will swap out of those and move into newer deals that we feel like are priced cheap that are have to clear the market mm -hmm. and um, represent uh, relative value. Great, great. So good prospects then. Yes. Well, great. Nancy and Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you. And thank you for joining us.